I am good to go, yeah. Let's get started. So my thought that I've had, uh, for those of you that are joining us uh, this week and um, maybe joining us for the first time, I'm Dr. Craig, doc joined by my colleague, Dr. John McPhee. And, you know, over the course of the well, last week and then this week and the third and the fourth week, we're going to be focusing on the eat by design component uh, with regards to nutritional intake. Um, never before, I would say, uh, well, actually, we've been doing these for the last, what, three or four months, I guess, since this uh, COVID pandemic had come about and um, mm -hmm. kind of switched from an in-class, in-office presentations to doing this as a webinar format. And uh, it's going really, really well. Um, but, you know, I was given some thought to this the other day and really kind of looking at just everything that's been going on here in the last several months, one thing that has become extremely apparent and is, is probably no shock to some of you, but the, with regards to COVID, your current level of health status, so how healthy you are right now is a really strong determinant of how risk you are, at risk you are from suffering from a serious complication as a result of COVID. And I say that because in and of itself, from the data, from everything else, COVID hasn't claimed very many lives or caused a lot of infirmary. But what it has done is that if you have a comorbidity or some other illness, it's almost like it amplifies the effect onto your immune system, your nervous system, therefore causing compromise, which puts you at severe risk for a fatality. And we see this, right? Like we're seeing people that say, well, you know, so-and-so passed away as a result of COVID, healthy, right? And then we find out that maybe they had a pre-diabetic condition or they had actually had heart disease that we didn't know about or one of these other uh, illnesses that is as a comorbidity that has given them such a much more vulnerable state and COVID being an opportunistic virus like most of them are, has now actually compromised their health to the point where they are in a real dire situation. So I say that in, in the concept of like, when we go through nutrition, we go through eat by design, I don't believe that there has ever been a more important time to be focused on one's health in the physical aspect, the mental and uh, emotional aspect, and the nutritional biochemical aspect. And that's kind of why we put these together and what you know, my, people like myself and Dr. John have been speaking about for years is trying to, to, to really get people to focus on their health more so than just how they're feeling. Because again, we always ask the question, like, how do you know when you're healthy? And 99% and of people say, well, when I'm, when I feel good, I'm healthy. And when I feel bad, I'm unhealthy. And what we realize with COVID and, and kind of what I'm just mentioning about comorbidities is how you feel is not, uh, indicative of how healthy you are because unfortunately some of uh, people who have had comorbidities and not maybe known about it felt great but then as they encountered COVID it started to actually create a real dire situation for them. So I say that with, with uh, intention that we want to make sure that as we go through these, these uh, sessions we want to really encourage people to really get strongly focused on making their body as healthy and as strong as they possibly can because that has such a huge impact on your resiliency for encountering any kind of illnesses, right? And that doesn't matter, just not just COVID. It could be anything else that you could be faced with, but that's kind of the point. And so when we talk about choices and decisions and we say, well, yeah, but you know, I've got a genetic predisposition for diabetes or I've got a genetic predisposition for heart disease, um, we talk about how important our choices are in the matter because you can have a map which is your blueprint of your dna that's kind of what you were born oh, with. that thing though i wanted to oh it's, uh, sorry i'm just gonna mute a couple there we go um you know how important your your dna is really your blueprint right it's it's kind of from mom and dad the two cells came together and they made you and all the brilliance and extraordinary person that you are that is part of the, 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 the story because in your genetic code and your makeup, uh, little spiral strands of, of information that are in all of your cells, what happens is your choices, your lifestyle dictates which portions of that strain of information gets read or gets uh, expressed 
which then ultimately determines whether or not you are going to develop something like heart disease or cancer or diabetes or other things. So it comes down to there's genes are one part of the story, but your choices have a huge impact on whether or not genes get expressed and things start to show up for you in your life. So we talk about choices and John, if you can go back to one slide, uh, some of you have seen this slide before. This is a famous study called the Agouti mouse study. And the Agouti mouse is normally that big yellow uh, healthy looking mouse there on the far left. It's kind of a robust type size. That's the normal genetic makeup for an Agouti mouse. Now what they did is they actually started to provide these mice with a different uh, nutritional intake and the Agouti mouse actually, let me give you a little bit of background. So the Agouti mouse reproduces at a really fast rate. Like you can go through seven or eight generations in a matter of just a short period of time. So what happens is they, they, they are born, they rise up to a point in which they can actually breed, they make more babies, so on and so on. So what they did is they took this yellow Agouti mouse and they started to provide it with a improper nutritional intake. And what happened was, is they started to see changes within their genetic expression. Okay, so the Agouti mouse, purebred, DNA is built into it. They started to change its diet. And what they started to see is subsequent generations began to show more and more expressive phenotypic or the actual uh, indicative, as you can see on the screen there, modeled appearance of uh, the mice over the course of several generations to the point where the pseudo agouti, which is that little small brown mouse, um, started to express a completely different presentation of you know, physical and, and appearance, right? Then what they did is they actually took those pseudo agouti mouse and they started to re-implement their normal natural dietary intake and within another six or seven generations they started to see them return back to their actual proper phenotypic DNA expressed yellow robust type size again. So all that to say is that not only do the choices that we undertake within our own lives matter, but they also start to have an effect on our offspring. So as we start to raise families and grandchildren and great grandchildren, some of the choices and decisions that we have right now can actually start to make an impact on future generations. That's not to be heavy in any way, but what it's meant to be is just how important your choices matter in the story of how you express health. And if you can start to focus on making subtle changes over a period of time, we're going to start to express health, not only for ourselves, but then for future generations. And that's really what Life by Design is all about, is that we want to focus on how do we express life in the eat by design, you know, the move by design, the power by design, and the think by design. And in the, the eat by design, that's what we're gonna be talking about here in this month. The move by design is just how you move your body. What is the genetic expression of how your body is supposed to move? What are the essential requirements that our bodies need in order to express health? Because when we provide those requirements in sufficiency and purity and we allow them to happen, we express health. But if we don't, and we provide, you know, in toxic and insufficiency, like if you don't get enough vitamin C, we can get scurvy. Like that's a natural process that happens when you don't provide the body with enough of the essential requirements for it to express health. So those are just some simple ideas. But, and then of course, you know, the, the think by design is such an important part because how you, what your outlook is on the world, what social connections you have, what sense of direction and purpose and other things that you have has a huge impact on your mental state, which then starts to affect the choices. And I always joke and said, have you ever been to the gym where you drive into the parking lot and you sit there and you're trying to talk yourself into going into the gym to work out? So you're sitting there for a few minutes and then you decide, okay, I'm not going to work out today. I'm just going to go home. How does that work out for you? So you go home you sit down, you probably eat a meal or a food that you don't really, you know, doesn't really give you vibrant, vibrancy and health. You feel bad about it. You didn't exercise and you can see how the triangle starts to uh, descend, right? You feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. So then you maybe continue to berate yourself internally and have this internal discussion. But on the flip side, 
you go into the gym, you work out, you feel great. Your natural tendency is to start to fuel your body with good, healthy foods because you're now expressing health at a higher vibrancy level and your vitality and everything else starts to shift, right? It's the same thing. It's like, you know, you, you get sit down in front of Netflix and you watch, oh, I'm just going to watch this little half hour show and that'll be it. And then, you know, next thing you go, three or four hours have gone by and you're like, I don't know what just happened to the last half of my day. Um, that's called inertia and momentum, right? And it's the same thing on the flip side is that once you start working out or once you start eating right, or once you start changing your thinking, the momentum starts to carry forward. So that's kind of the, uh, the message is that as we make choices and decisions, we always say it's not really too important where on the continuum you are. The only thing that really matters is what dis what, uh, which direction are you going? Are you moving towards health? Or are you moving towards symptom sickness and disease? And the choices that we make can have a huge impact on that. And that's the thing that we're trying to encourage people is let's do some things that are simple and easy to implement so that we can start moving forward in a positive direction that's going to have huge implications on our health. And so, you know, if any of that sounded heavy, I'll relieve it with this little, this little pressure valve release. Um, you can't undo a good thing by doing a bad thing, but you can undo a bad thing by doing a good thing. And when it comes to nutrition, don't focus on what you did wrong. Focus on the things that you can do here and now that can move you forward. So again, if it's not, um, you can't undo a good thing by doing a bad thing, but you can undo a bad thing by doing a good thing. So that's my message for that. Now, Eat By Design, we're going to talk about the big fat lie. And if any of you have been following any kind of nutritional stuff in the last 25, 30 years, oh boy, we've seen some huge things that have come out, um, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there was some real vilification of, of fat, right? We started to see uh, brands had started to implement things like Olestra, which was a uh, a, a man-made chemical that actually limited your fat uptake by eating potato chips. So you saw potato chips covered in Olestra. It was a man-made chemical that blocked your body's uptake of fat because fat was the devil. It was evil. It was, it was cause of heart disease and it was a cause of fatty liver and, and, and cirrhosis and a whole bunch of other things. And if you've been following the last, I'd say what, John, the last four or five, six, maybe even 10 years now, the kind of tide is starting to flip. But just like getting people to make changes, some of the damage had been done and that big tanker has been slow to stop the momentum and to start to get it going in a different direction. So we want to kind of expose some of the, the lies when it comes to fat. We want to help you to understand better about how you can make better choices and decisions. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of like, you know, what fat should I use for cooking or what fat is good to, uh, to eat that is good for my joints? What fats do I want to stay away from? Um, so we're going to talk about all of those today. Okay. Uh, if you want to flip that one, Dr. John. Any yeah, other? yeah, for sure. Okay. So Dr. John's going to kind of take it on from here. We're going to talk about um, you know, st simple strategies that we can start to implement. And we're going to talk about the, the lies when it comes to the fats within our nutritional intake. So here we go. Yeah, actually, let's just jump right into that. Cause uh, just as uh, Dr. Craig was saying, um, we've been fed, uh, pun intended, a, uh, <laughs> Love pun. you know, I'd, I would say a lot of well-meaning, well-intentioned, uh, I will call them facts, right? Uh, over the last uh, 70 years or so around nutrition, and, uh, you know, I'm going to highlight a couple of the myths that, unfortunately, I think probably most of us, certainly I've definitely bought into these uh, over the years, and I think they're really common uh, in, uh, in our culture. Uh, but the, as Dr. Craig was just saying, it's the, the reality, the, the actual research that's coming out now to, to reverse these myths, actually shine the light on what the truth is. Um, it just, it takes a long time to uh, turn the boat around, right? It's, uh, there's... We've had 70 years of moving in one direction where we've been learning this myth, right? That uh, saturated fat makes you fat, right? It's, uh, this one is, um, I, I, I think, uh, particularly confusing because it's the same word that we use to describe the stuff that we find on our bodies, 
right? The adipose tissue, or the, you know, when we're uh, overweight, we call it fat, right? Um, the fat that builds up on our body, well, it make it just like it's intuitive, right? Like if I eat fat, it probably just becomes fat on my body. And um, well, that that can be true. It's not it's not a hundred percent false. If you were to eat, um, you know, a whole whack of fat and not burn those calories, um, then sure, it's gonna it's probably gonna get converted to fat on your body as a, a way of storing energy on your body. Um, but what we what we know now um, the much bigger driver of uh, weight gain uh, and actually also with more recently the one of the biggest drivers of maintaining uh, uh, overweightness okay so maintaining a, a higher than normal weight uh, a lot of people really struggle at losing weight and the, the key factor is inflammation um, inflammation is actually the um, you know, a normal process in the body. I won't go down, I won't go too deep into the uh, biochemistry here, but, you know, inflammation is normal um, or normal inflammation is normal. <laughs> it's a normal process in the body, but it can go haywire. And there's a bunch of different factors that can uh, drive your body into like a really inflamed state. Um, but what I can say, and this is a real, uh, you know, kind of pull back all the uh, extraneous the details, um, inflammation, chronic systemic inflammation in the body sits at the root of all chronic health problems. So we talk about, um, you know, ob obesity or being uh, overweight, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, um, autoimmune disorders. They all have this common root, which is inflammation. And it's actually um, now the, the best theory on uh, weight gain and, get, uh, you know, not being able to lose weight is that your body is in a chronic inflamed state. And so it's just, it's unable to, uh, properly um, uh, to burn or, or to, um, yeah, for lack of a better word, burn the um, stored, fat, stored energy, which is fat, on the body. Um, and it also is uh, because uh, inflammation represents stress. Uh, stress, uh, you can imagine back in the day, if we were under a lot of stress, your body wanted to store fat, um, store energy, and store it as fat so that you had energy in the future because um, you never knew when you were going to get your next meal. So, um, so all that to say, this uh, saturated fat makes you fat is actually um, is a myth. Okay, there's no, uh, there's no, nothing about eating fat itself that um, turns it into fat on your body. Uh, and in fact, I could um, make a, a really strong argument that if you were to eat more fat and less of something else, um, uh, that you would actually probably lose weight. You may actually and would most certainly feel better. Um, and that comes from uh, one of the main drivers of inflammation, which is the consumption of sugar. We know uh, in Canada alone, uh, 1.2, this number is uh, certainly higher. This is from 2014. So uh, likely it's more closer to 2 million Canadians um, are di uh, diagnosed with diabetes. There's probably 10x uh, of that that are pre-diabetic or you know, have high blood, chronically high blood sugar, but they uh, just haven't been labeled diabetic yet. Um, and we know that that is a, uh, indicator of that chronic systemic inflammation, and that is sits at the root of um, what makes us fat. So um, we know that when we eat saturated fat, actually, I would say, uh, I, well, I'll just jump in right into this, the, the myth number two here is that saturated fat um, is, a, is a cause of death, right? And this is something that like way more serious um, uh, allegation against saturated fat, <laughs> that it's, caught, it's the main cause of heart disease, um, we know that in Canada, there's, uh, you know, upwards of 50,000 Canadians, uh, Canadians that die every year of heart disease. So this is a big problem. Uh, and we want to know, okay, well, what's, uh, you know, what role, if anything, does saturated fat play in uh, the, the development of heart disease? And uh, unfortunately, we can go way back um, into uh, the history of nutritional science. And this guy, uh, who definitely deserves to be made fun of here um, with this caricature, uh, his name is Ansel Keys, and he actually, uh, the, the quote you can't see on there, I apologize, it says artery clogging saturated fat. So he kind of coined this term, um, attaching the idea of um, saturated fat literally fills up your arteries and um, causes the you know, blood flow to get disrupted to the heart and then that causes heart attacks. Um, and uh, he was the, the main proponent of this argument and became like quite a famous researcher uh, and a, Long story short, it turns out that uh, in the 80s, what uh, Dr. Craig was referring to, um, is it came out that he had uh, performed 
and a lot of his early studies that laid the foundation for this um, was wrought with uh, fraud. There's just tons of fraud. Um, he had uh, of, um, not used data that was available um, that contradicted his um, his statements. He actually, um, uh, in one particular study, the most uh, the biggest uh, I guess episode of fraud is that he had a whole bunch of different um, had data from a bunch of different countries, uh, over 30 countries, and he just selected the seven countries that um, showed a nice relationship between eating saturated fat and heart disease. And he eliminated all the countries that didn't match his uh, hypothesis. So um, he's one of the main reasons, the reason why I include him here is because he's actually one of the main reasons why each of us have been taught that saturated fat is bad. Um, but of course now we have, um, you know, over the last 30, 40 years, there's been uh, the low fat craze. We have uh, all these products on the market that um, are touted as being healthy because they don't have saturated fat. But what's happened is that, as a, you know, fat is something that our body, our brains really like <laughs> and our, our taste buds really like. So we've reduced saturated fat, particularly from animals, and we've increased um, the, how much uh, vegetable oils, so things like uh, canola oil, um, uh, and it, like uh, the industrial uh, processed oils from seeds um, and uh, soy oil is another example. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them, but those are actually uh, way, way more problematic for the body. So we've, we've cut out the food that is potentially healthy and we've dramatically increased the, the, the food type that is really, um, it drives inflammation in the body. So we know that uh, these large scale um, industrial seed uh, oil production, that those oils are actually quite toxic in the body. Uh, especially when we cook with them, uh, they are really unstable and so they become really uh, uh, difficult for the body to uh, digest um, and they create inflammation in the gut and that can extend to the body itself. Um, we also know that uh, along with all this low fat craze, we've seen this major spike in heart disease, especially in North America, uh, and we have this epidemic of chronic disease. So there's a whole bunch of uh, unanswered questions there about um, saturated fat. We know now that the best available research in 2020 is that, uh, and actually the American Heart uh, Association has reluctantly um, agreed to this along with uh, uh, the, there's one other major organization I can I'm blanking on right now, um, but they've actually acknowledged that saturated fat is not associated, consumption of saturated fat is not associated with any um, uh, evidence of heart disease. So uh, that's the, uh, that we've, we've been waiting for them to make that decision because there's been uh, about 10 years of research to support it. Um, and actually, I would say that uh, saturated fat coming from a good source is a health food. It's uh, something that um, our bodies are actually uh, do really well on fueling um, from uh, saturated fat. F fat itself comes packaged with tons of micronutrients. Um, there's a whole uh, section of uh, vitamins and nutrients that are what's called fat soluble. So they only come packaged in fat. So if you're re removing um, fat from the diet, um, we're actually missing out on those fat soluble vitamins. Uh, vitamin D is a great example of a vitamin that our body produces, but it requires fat to be able to make it um, uh, 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 along with a whole bunch of other um, vitamins and nutrients. Um, the other one that uh, the third myth um, that we've all been told, and it kind of goes along with the heart disease uh, story is that cholesterol itself, so cholesterol is a part of fat. Um, so, I mean, that's not actually true, but um, cholesterol, uh, we, we've been told that we get uh, cholesterol from eating foods that are high in fat and, um, and that cholesterol itself is what kills you uh, when it builds up in the arteries. And uh, again, this has been, uh, the story is just way more complicated than that, um, and it's too broad for this conversation. But I think a, a good a good take home point around cholesterol is that um, the majority of cholesterol is made by your body, so your body actually produces cholesterol um, as a um, it, it's an essential. You can think of it as a molecule. It's an essential molecule in the body um, that actually transports stuff around. So cholesterol itself is essential, like almost every cell in your body has cholesterol built into it. Uh, we know that cholesterol is, I've got a few other things listed here. It's a requirement for optimum health as like a, a, a broad statement, but it's uh, all your brain cells, like a, a significant portion of the weight of your brain is actually cholesterol. 
Uh, we know that there's a, a major relationship between um, learning and memory, particularly memory, um, and uh, the, the, uh, having adequate amounts of cholesterol in the body. Um, it's a precursor to all steroid hormones, so all the hormones that your body produces um, that drives uh, the majority of your, um, well, certainly all your sex hormones, but also some of your like really high order hormones, like cortisol is another great example of a stress hormone. It comes from uh, build, okay, like cholesterol is the building blocks for making those hormones. And vitamin D, as I mentioned before, and the, and the lining of the cells um, also contains cholesterol. So it's a, it's a huge deal. Uh, and there's actually, it's really um, problematic, the fact that we're so focused on reducing the number, like the cholesterol count. Uh, I'm not a cardiologist. I'm certainly not a, um, claiming I understand everything about cholesterol. I do know that uh, you want to uh, ask questions. So if you're on cholesterol lowering medication, uh, a good idea is just to speak to your doctor about um, whether that's the best um, thing for you long term, um, especially as it relates to the uh, brain health. I think that's probably the, the area that um, is the most questionable. Uh, there's some good research that just uh, came out recently about uh, individuals on cholesterol lowering medication and the uh, increased uh, incidence of things like Alzheimer's and dementia. So uh, there's no cause and effect relationship there, but it's, uh, it's, I think it's, it bears asking the question. Um, so cholesterol itself, yeah, I mean, uh, the majority of it's built in, by the body, so we don't have to worry too much about where you're getting it from, like uh, where you're eating it from. Certainly egg yolk is a good source of, of cholesterol. Uh, but the main kind of, I guess, takeaway from today is that health, uh, fat and healthy fat, so I'll kind of, kind of care, uh, qualify that, um, fat from a, a healthy animals or um, vegetarian sources like avocado, coconut oil, uh, olive oil, um, these are all uh, I would put them in the category of a health food. Okay, I'd, uh, I would actually put them in the same category as things like blueberries or grass-fed steak or, um, you know, these foods. Um, the uh, food type is just so important for how your body functions. Um, some good ideas for increasing your quality uh, fat intake. There's, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different types and I'm happy to share this so you can kind of uh, look at it after the fact, but, um, Really what you want to focus on is uh, these top three. So long chain saturated fats, basically fats from, uh, from animals. Okay. Um, you can get medium chain saturated fats from like coconut oil, uh, which is a, a great source of, of fat. Uh, also, there's a myth going around that coconut oil is bad for you. And that's, uh, that has been debunked in several different places. So if you're curious about that, if you've seen that headline recently, let me know. I'm happy to, to forward you the, uh, the debunking. Um, and then monounsaturated fats, that's the ones that uh, come mainly from uh, vegetarian sources. Um, so eating lots of those fats. I think uh, if you, uh, are, when you're building your plate, actually think of, okay, first protein. So protein is like building every plate, plate around a protein. And then what kind of fat can you add to that? Um, it's, uh, it's a great way to um, hit that satiety signal. So like when you feel full, um, protein and fat are certainly the like big drivers of that. Uh, and you're getting a real good complement of uh, the uh, nutrients, so uh, vitamins and minerals uh, when you're eating lots of protein and fat. Um, the other one that we often hear about is polyunsaturated fats. These are the, uh, the keywords here, are like the omega-3, omega-6. Um, the big thing here is you just want to get lots of omega-3s, uh, omega-6s, um, so omega threes are, I mean, you often see this as uh, fish oil. So we, this is how we uh, choose to help people with this one. Um, just take a high quality fish oil supplement. It does come in all kind of grass fed animals or pasture raised animals have good amounts of omega threes. Uh, omega sixes we get a ton of from uh, all the uh, industrial uh, seed oils, uh, and often even though we want to get a ratio of one to one roughly of these. Uh, a lot of North Americans are walking around, you know, with a ratio of like one to 40, one to 20. So um, that really drives inflammation in, in the body. Um, so that uh, gives you a, a good kind of overall sense. I think if I hit the take home point, it's um, for most of us, e increasing the amount of fat that you're eating and, and just being conscious of the, where you're choosing it from, um, uh, having a good variety. So eating both animal and vegetarian sources and, uh, and, and, and then just, uh, if you 
yourself are on any um, cholesterol lowering medications or if you know someone who is, um, you just suggest that they um, speak with their medical doctor because I, I think there's a, you want to make sure that there's a, a good positive benefit um, because there are, are definitely some costs there. Anything to add there, Craig? Uh, actually, if you um, can pause your share screen, I'm going to share one. Sure. Uh, I wanted to just kind of touch on something that you were speaking on that I think is huge. And that is, um, you, you kind of went through the concept of stress. And I think it's important to understand in an acute stress response. So you're down by the water, you're having a great time, have a nice little picnic, and then out jumps a bear your body goes into a sympathetic fight or flight state. And all of these things, this is a really busy slide, but this is going to help you to understand a little bit more about what Dr. John was talking about when it comes to inflammation is actually by far the most worst thing that you can have for your health. I think you can, you can honestly probably narrow down almost every single illness in mankind to one of two things, your inability to regulate your inflammation levels and your inability to regulate your blood sugar levels. So, if you look at this response, this is what happens immediately when your nervous system goes into an acute stress response. You get cortisol, which is your stress hormones. You get catecholamines, which are your adrenaline and other types of hormones. Your heart rate goes up. Your vasoconstriction, so your blood pressure is going to go up. Your blood glucose levels go up. Grow up. <laughs> go up. <laughs> your blood profile, like your lipids, so your fats start to circulate, your triglycerides actually start to circulate through your bloodstream. Uh, your blood cholesterol goes up. Your LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, and I put that in quotation marks because there's no such thing as bad or good, there just is. The increased uh, low density lipoproteins, which are the bad cholesterol uh, for the purpose of conversation, those are the ones that make up the big backbone of all your, your stress hormones, right? And they also have a huge impact on wound clotting. So if the bear bites you, you're going to need to close up that wound as quick as possible. And LDL is a huge impact on clotting factors for making that happen. Your HDL is the one that scoops up all of the, the cholesterol that's in your body and it brings it back to the liver for recycling and kind of brings those triglycerides and other things back for recycling, right? Your clotting factors go up, so your blood gets stickier, it gets a little bit more syrupy. Um, your protein degradation of muscle and connective tissue, why? Because if you're gonna fight the bear, you're gonna burn through some muscle tissue and connective tissue to have higher levels of strength. Your insulin resistance, you don't want blood going into, um, uh, staying into, like into your, you want it immediately for your muscle contraction. So your insulin goes up, but your ability to uptake it goes down. So your blood glucose levels, as we talked about, goes up. You have increased feelings of stress, fear, and anxiety. Why? Because you're not meant to feel good in that moment. You're meant to look for ways to escape and to fight. Your memory goes down. You're not going to think about long division when a bear's chasing you. You don't feel good. So your serotonin drops, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that to say, how are we looking on the left-hand side for heart disease, how we looking for high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, mm -hmm. those are normal when your body's in acute stress response. We don't have bears chasing us most of the time, but what we have is families, finances, COVID, uh, pandemic lockdowns. We've got all of these situations that are raising our acute stress responses. And yes, our cholesterol goes up because it's a natural byproduct about it. So all that to say is it really comes down to your stress response. We don't want to add more stress to our bodies by not moving, not eating, and not thinking in a proper manner, which is going to cause us to go into a more chronic stress response, which is very, very damaging for our health. So all that to say is that, yes, choices matter and how you make choices with your food and your nutrition has a huge impact. And you can start to unwind this response by bringing your body back into a state of balance. Power by design helps us to get our nervous systems back into a calm state so that we can get the parasympathetic. We can get the brakes pumping on the acute stress response and we can slow down the impact of our cortisol. So the, the other side of that is that when we get into a 
a parasympathetic, which is our brake system in our nervous systems. We decrease our cortisol, we decrease our catecholamines, we decrease heart rate, vasoconstriction, blood pressure, glucose, cholesterol, all of that. Combine that with providing your body the essential requirements to move, eat, and think, and you're starting to win and you're starting to move in the right direction. Hope that helps to clarify and to tie a bunch of stuff together. So choices matter. Now, if you have questions, by the way, I don't think we mentioned this, but if you have questions, feel free to pump those into the uh, chat box there. And um, John, anything else? We do else? have a question. Okay. Yeah, well, I'll just address this question um, from Carol. Uh, she asks, um, what is the best oil to use in cooking? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that's a great, uh, uh, great question. And good. You definitely want to be um, choosing, I, I would say, <laughs> uh, public service announcement, like just throw out any of the um, those industrial seed oils. So um, I, I always blank on a few of them, but there's soy, there's canola, there's uh, rapeseed, there's um, flax. Flax isn't as bad, actually. Um, but uh, canola and soy are the two biggest ones that we see in the market. Uh, get rid of those. Um, for cooking, I have like a good quality um, uh, extra virgin olive oil. It's great for cooking. Uh, it cooks at high temperature. Just use it only once, so you don't want to be repeating uh, use of uh, olive oil. Um, same thing goes with coconut oil. It's really stable at high temperatures, uh, adds a really nice flavor. Um, so I, I usually stick to those two. The other ones that uh, are great to use, um, I, I, if I have good quality bacon, then I'll save the fat and I'll cook with it later. Uh, same thing goes, um, there's a, a local butcher here that uh, I get duck fat from occasionally, and that's delicious. <laughs> Making uh, cooking some uh, vegetables and, and duck fat is, is awesome. Um, so th those are a few uh, suggestions for you. But I think go-tos, uh, good quality olive oil and coconut oil are, uh, are great ones to just have on the counter. Uh, any other questions, you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself and say it verbally, or you can add in the chat. I think we're gonna lose this um, connection here momentarily. So, uh, last call for questions. Okay. Um,